Good morning, church. Good to see you again. Enjoyed baptizing those three uh, precious young ladies. What a great, uh, what a great thing to begin your life that way, serving the Lord at an early age. So proud of, um, I'm proud of those three young ladies. Look, we have a blessed uh, couple here with us today. I want to take a moment and recognize them. It's not every day that a couple can be married for 65 years. Now, that is a long time. Uh, 65 years. Where are you, Ann and uh, uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Ernie Woodby? Where are y'all? I know y'all are here. I feel it. Hey, hey, hey. There you are. That's awesome. Amen. Yes, Ann, you were married when you were 10. That's pretty amazing. You know, the child weddings back then, no. God bless y'all. We love y'all. What a faithful, faithful couple. Served the Lord for so many years and still going strong. And I know some of your family is here to celebrate this big milestone with y'all. And we celebrate with you as your church family. Uh, so we've had children baptized. We have older couple uh, being recognized. But we also have many students. There's a lot of vacancies in our room today because we have lots of students on camp, in camp. And they're having a fabulous time. They will leave in the morning about 7 o'clock, thereabout. And they will make their way back here uh, around 9 o'clock. And so remember them in prayer. Our student pastor, uh, Jeffrey Samplaski, is with them, as well as our college pastor, uh, Gary Hendrickson. So we've been praying for them. That's the reason for the wristband. I haven't been admitted. Some of y'all think I should be, but I'm not, I haven't been admitted in a hospital or anything like that. But this is my, my buddy that I'm praying for. Many of you have been praying for your student, and uh, many of you have also been sending in letters that they're reading to the uh, to the campers, which I think that's uh, fantastic. They are having a, they're having way too much fun. I'm seeing some of the pictures. Good for them. That's, that's awesome. We're going to continue on in the book of Acts, chapter 20. If you have your Bible, I'd love for you to read along with me. We're going to cover about 12 verses this morning in our study uh, of the book of Acts, Church on the Move. The title of the message today is Pressing Forward. My name is Danny Forshee, pastor at Great Hills. I don't know if um, this is your first time or hundredth time, uh, but we're delighted to have you be with us, not only here in the sanctuary, but even more people are worshiping with us online, and we're delighted to, we're delighted to have you. Of course, we'd love for you to come. If you're within 100 miles or so, you know, make the journey, drive. But we do have people from Bastrop. I think that's the furthest from Bastrop. They come up our, our uh pilot friend, uh, Roger, who drives up Melanie every, uh, every Sunday. So we welcome you online. God bless you. We're studying the Word of God. That's what we do at Great Hills. One of our core values, actually it's core value number one, is we teach and preach uh, the Word of God. And I would say buckle up because this is quite a fascinating passage of Scripture. The year is about A.D. 57. The Apostle Paul is on his third missionary journey. What number is he on? Third. All right. He's third out of four. And so we have traced the first two. We're right in the middle here of this third journey, and it is a fascinating, fascinating read. You're going to be encouraged. I think you're also going to be challenged and motivated by the example of the Apostle Paul, his inexorable zeal, his tenacity to not give up, but to persevere and to fulfill the calling that God has placed on his life to be a missionary, to be an evangelist, a theologian, a church planter. He is all of those things, and he is my hero. I, I look forward to the day in heaven when I get to meet this man, my hero of the faith. He, he's so determined. He will not stop until God calls him, calls him home. He is a servant, and we're going to notice today as he, uh, as he preaches, as he gives, as he ministers, as he perseveres, I really think you're going to be encouraged uh, today. I don't know about y'all, but I love reading the stories of men and women who sell out to Christ. Now, I know we have lots of examples, unfortunately, of people that sell out to other things, uh, but what, an, what a blessing it is, what a motivation it is for me uh, when I read about like stories about Richard Stearns. Uh, Richard Stearns from 20, 2008 uh, to 2018, he was the president of World Vision International. And it's a powerful ministry all over the world where they help out in humanitarian aid as well as preaching the gospel. But man, if you would have looked at Richard Stearns in his early life and said, hey, young man, you're going to be leading uh, one of the most uh, important, influential uh, Christian organizations in the world. 
he would have absolutely, not only would he have laughed at you, he probably would have punched you. Mr. Ivy League, Cornell University, neurobiology major. Goes on to the Wharton School of Business and gets his master's degree. He says in his own words, he says, I was very bright and I was very, very arrogant. Anytime somebody tried to talk to me about God, I would laugh in their face. Even Renee, sweet little Renee, my friend, she would encourage me to read the Bible, to open up my mind to the things of the spiritual, metaphysical world, and he would just say, no, that is for weaklings. That is not for brilliant people like me. <laughs> I, I, I imagine God just looks at people like that. And he just smiles, just kind of shakes his head and goes, oh, my goodness. Wait till you see what I have in store uh, for you. Between college and graduate school, Richard said, okay, I'll do it. I'll just begin to read about Christianity. He read one book until 4 a.m. He couldn't put it down. John R.W. Stott, fabulous English theologian, preacher. He read his book, Basic Christianity, till 4 a.m. And then the next day, he went and purchased all kinds of books on philosophy and theology and uh, science. He says, okay, this, this is kind of messing with my world here. And by the time Renee... Praise God for the Renees in our life. I mean, she is praying for him. Other believers are praying for him. And so finally, he says in his own testimony, I fell to my knees and I said, my Lord and my God, I ask you to forgive me of my arrogance and my unbelief. And I commit my life from this day forward to the service of Christ. He and Renee got married, by the way. It's kind of fun how the way that works out. And he took his first job and with Gillette. He was in the marketing department of Gillette. Then he just had this meteoric rise. He became the president of Parker Brothers Games, then the president and the CEO of Linux at the height of his professional career, making a lot of money. He sensed the call of God into the ministry. Now, what do you do with that? What if you are doing very well and you sense God has another plan for your life and you, you call him Lord, but you're really not sure? You're like, Lord, you, you want me to leave? I will have to take a 75% cut in pay. I will have to give up my Jaguar automobile to do what? To serve, to serve full time in a Christian humanitarian age. And he goes, and God and him just wrestled. I mean, they just, he just like Jacob, wrestling with this call of God on his life. And finally, he gave up and he served. And he served so wonderfully from 2008 to 2018. You can read his story uh, in the book, The Hole in Our Gospel, H-O-L-E. The Hole in or the missing link in our gospel, he says today, is uh, we, we don't meet needs quite like God would have us to meet needs. When we meet people's needs and serve them, it just opens up this great opportunity to preach the gospel to them. When I, when I read his story, it reminds me of Paul. I mean, there's this inexorable, relentless, no uh, bars hold. I mean, they are just going forward, and they're going to serve God no matter what. I don't know what that does for y'all. Some of you would probably rather me not share stories like that because you're like, well, that makes me uncomfortable. And what if God, what if God were to ask me to do that? What if he were to ask you to do that, to leave something cherished and lucrative behind to go and to serve him uh, into the unknown? Well, this is what Paul does. I want to begin reading in Acts chapter 20. He is well on his way, serving the Lord, finishing, finishing strong. Chapter 20, uh, verses 1 and 2. After the uproar, interesting word, uh, thorobus, which means historic, hysterical, uncontrollable mob, when this uproar had ceased, in verse 1, Paul called the disciples to himself. He embraced them, and he departed to go to uh, Macedonia. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. Let's stop right there. Paul is on his journey, right? The Bible says after this uproar had happened. Y'all remember last week? If you were here last week, it was quite an uproar in Ephesus. Remember the people were shouting for two solid hours, great is the goddess Diana. And, they, and Paul was like, he was ready to go in and defend the faith and perhaps even lose his life. And yet he, he's like, God, is that what you want me to do? And the people are like, no, Paul, you, you don't need to do that. It's not your time yet. 
And so after this uproar, remember we, we looked at last week and the magistrates and the, and the mayors and the people of the city just kind of came together. Cooler heads prevailed. Things settled down. And now Paul says, okay, guys, you're ready to go. I mean, Paul did not let the grass grow very long under his feet. This is the longest tenured ministry he will have in his entire life. Now, John is way different. John will pastor the church at Ephesus for 30 years. Paul only stays at Ephesus for three years. But after things have settled, he says, okay, missionary band, let's, let's strike up the cord and let's get back on the road. And sure enough, they travel to Macedonia, northwest from Ephesus, and he does it for two reasons. First of all, Paul is going to go uh, back to that region of the world, Macedonia, where we just, Great Hills, last year helped plant, build a church there in Macedonia. Uh, they've invited me to go and preach. Your dad did, Jeff. I wanted to go really bad, but I, I can't go. May not even be able to go next year, but I'm certainly hoping to go the following year in Sasho's church and to preach there in the same region of the world, Macedonia. So he goes for two reasons. Number one, he's going to go and encourage the brethren. Parakaleo is the Greek word. It means to call together and to admonish and to encourage and build them up in their faith. Watch this, church. Paul had planted a lot of these churches. Thessaloniki and Philippi and in Athens and Corinth. And so he wants to go back. He is a disciple maker. He's not just an evangelist to lead somebody to Christ. He wants to build them up and help them grow and to mature in their walk with Christ. And so he goes to do that, build them up. But number two, and I love this about Paul, Paul is going to take up an offering. He's going to receive an offering from the churches that he planted, and he will deliver this offering to the church at Jerusalem. Jerusalem is suffering a great famine, the whole city. And the believers are suffering especially because some of them have been terminated in their jobs. Some of them have been ostracized in the community. And so Paul is traveling throughout Asia. He's taken up an offering and he's going to go and deliver it to the church there uh, in Jerusalem. All right, so we're talking about his preaching, number one, verses one and two. Now I'm going to look at verse seven with you for just a second because I'm going to highlight for you his preaching. Now, on the first day of the week, in verse 7, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them, okay? He preached to them, and he continued his message until midnight. Woo! Y'all couldn't handle it. I'm just, you, you couldn't. I don't think I could. At midnight. Y'all think I preach long. He's preaching till midnight, all right? And then verse 11, now, when he had come up, uh, he had broken bread and eaten, and he talked. He preached to them some more a long while, even until daybreak. What? Paul pulled an all-nighter in Troas. He preached all night. One guy fell out of the loft and died. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the, my point is, Paul is a preacher. He wants to encourage the body of Christ. And you say, what in the world could somebody say for 12 hours, solid preaching? I mean, preaching. But it was his passion. That was his joy. That was, his, that was the thrill of his life. And I believe with all my heart that the greatest gift a man of God called by God to preach the Holy Scripture is to do just that, to preach the Bible, to share messages of hope to take you through an expositional, exegetical exercise in homiletics and to share with you and to pour into you. That's exactly what Paul does. You know, a few months ago, we, I guess we came as close as we've ever come here at Great Hills. We, we pulled a 1 a.m. nighter, okay? And there's a bunch of us that met in the Great Hall, and it was called Secret Church. And we had a good number of people. Uh, David Platt preached to us for six hours and we were live streamed from his church there in Washington, D.C. And, man, it was, it was powerful. We had intermittent breaks. We'd eat a little bit. We're Baptists. I mean, we got to eat a little bit. This, this group ate a little bit. Then we would pray a little bit. And then we would hear more preaching. And, y'all, I'm telling you, as a preacher, and, and I was just soaking it up. And we're going to do it again next year, by the way, if you're interested. You're like, thanks, but no thanks, bro. Six hours of biblical teaching and worship. That sounds like the most boring thing in the world. Look, we're going to do it again. I think we'll have even more people this time. Look, David Platt is a wonderful preacher of the gospel. You'll come, you'll hear a great message, secret church, preaching, preaching, preaching. Here's what I think. And this is something I really should accentuate and stress every time I preach the book of Acts because 
we don't get it. We don't sense it, it the, the lethargy, the apathy that, that we have. I get it. You know why? Because we're not in revival. If we were in revival, man, it would it'd be different in here. There'd be, there'd be all kinds of joy when you're singing and excitement and enthusiasm, not the lethargy of, okay, yeah, you're preaching the Bible. and all. But you, you got to remember, when, when you're in the book of Acts, they are ministering in a milieu of spiritual awakening. I mean, God is moving. And Paul, he could preach all night. People didn't care. They're not going to complain. They're not going to worry about missing a meal. I mean, they're just, they're just in this sense. Of, and when revival comes, and I believe when revival comes here, it'll be very different. There'll be a movement of God. There'll be an enthusiasm. There'll be an excitement for the things of God, for the word of God. Trust me, I've been there. I've tasted it. And when God shows up and when the word of God is preached, it's on like Donkey Kong. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, the altar is filled with people praying, pouring out their hearts to God. Some of you are looking at me like, is that possible? Is that even possible? Would, would God dare to move in a city like ours, a church like us who you know, pretty satisfied and things just kind of go through the, the motions here. Could God invade this? And I tell you, you you'll, you'll see it and you'll sense it. I, I'm hope I'm, I hope I'm here to experience when the move of God, when the Spirit of God falls upon the church of God, whoo, man, enthusiasm, joy from the preaching of the Word of God. Second thing I want to share with you, number two is uh, the giving aspect. And I love this in verse two. You see it. Now, when he had gone over that region, he encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. Now, y'all looking at me like, how do you get giving out of that? You sure must be a preacher. You can find money anywhere in the Bible. Well, here's where you have to do a little background study, and then you'll say, oh, now I see it. So when Paul, on the third missionary journey, he's going to write uh, a couple of letters. At this very time in his life, he will write the book, 2 Corinthians. Isn't that cool? He will also write a well-known book, probably my favorite book in all the Bible, the book of Romans. Okay, It's during this time. And when you read the book of Romans and you read the book of 2 Corinthians, you'll begin to understand that, oh, now I understand 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 a little bit better when he says, but this I say... He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give. Come on now, church. This is in Macedonia and Achaia and, and church here uh, in Corinth. Let's give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. He's taking up that offering, remember? He's getting that offering for the church at Jerusalem that is struggling with famine. And so he's, he's traveling and he's preaching. He's encouraging and he's extending the offering plate. Oh, let me give you another one. Romans chapter 15. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. He's in Greece right now, but he's going to go to Jerusalem. But watch this. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution. There it is. A contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. So we have to read Corinthians and Romans to get it, but you see it, he's taken up this offering. So his twofold purpose of retracing his second missionary journey, now he's on his third, is to preach and encourage, right? People are, man, they're just up all night, they don't care, they're listening. And then number two, he's taken up this offering. And it's so important, church, and I don't, I don't want us to miss this. And I, it's just interesting how God, how God would work this out, that I would preach on giving on July the 17th when we're $500,000 behind in our expenses. You say, well, you just planned it like that. You just manipulated the timing, and you're just talking about money because, well, I'm talking about because that's what this whole... He's taken up this big offering to give to the church there at Jerusalem. Say, say that again. We're how much behind? Just a half million dollars behind. But we're half a million dollars behind to budget, right? I wish it was budget, but it's actually given. I tell you, the downturn in the economy has impacted us greatly. We have felt it. You say, well, what, what do you do with those monies? Uh, anyhow, where's your Jaguar? What, right? It's parked out back there. No, yesterday we had a, we had a worship service. 
It's seven days in a row for me. Some, some weeks are like that, right? You just gotta go, you just gotta work, gotta get it done. And what a privilege it was to preach Zahaya Napa's memorial service. There were like 10 people in the room, in this room, lots and lots of people online, and the whole place was air conditioned. Isn't that nice? As a widow at Great Hills Baptist Church, she, her family was not charged a dime. Guess who pays for that? We pay for that. And I'm blessed that we get to pay for that. So, oh, so that's where some of our monies go, stuff like that. Yeah, like 40 grand just to cut the grass. I don't know what your lawn care bill is at your house, but it's probably not $40,000. You say, how often? That? Well, that's annually, right? So it's a big house, lots of expenses, and so we're talking about collecting offerings. The greatest satisfaction in life comes when you take what God has given you and you invest it for the kingdom of God. Many, most don't get that. They don't, they don't see the importance of tithing and giving offerings, but when revival comes, man, when God shakes the place and the breath of the Spirit, the wind of the Spirit blows across us, man, it's, it's surplus it's bountiful, it's, it's moving and shaking and things are happening. And don't you long for that? I know I long for that. And I'm preaching for that. I'm praying for that. I'm pouring out my heart and soul for God to move in, in an unprecedented way upon us. That's number two, that is giving. Number three is persevering. Woohoo! Paul stayed in Greece for three months. Watch this now. Let's look at verse three. And he stayed there three months and when the Jews plotted against him, and he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through uh, Macedonia. And here's some guys, I hope I say their names right, y'all forgive me if I don't. Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia, and these men went ahead and they waited for us at Troas. But we sailed, I'm in verse six, I'm gonna explain this in just a minute, it's fabulous, this is phenomenal. But we sailed from, uh, away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in the five days we joined them at Troas where we stayed for seven days. So what, what happens here, let me, let me get my little map out, I think this will, this will help explain it. I wanna show you what, what's going on with Paul on his third missionary journey, okay? So here, here they are in Ephesus, right? And Paul says he's going to go to Macedonia and Achaia, and he's going to go to Philippi, Thessaloniki. He's going to go to the church at Athens, going to go to the church in, in Corinth. There it is. All right, and so when he does this, from Corinth, he was ready to set sail back to Syria. Did y'all see that? That is a direct line from Corinth all the way back to Syria, okay? He'll go to Antioch and then come on down to Jerusalem. But he hears there's a plot against his life. How about that? What if you serve God so faithfully that people are ready to kill you? And that's what he was experiencing in Corinth. Corinth, they hated him in Corinth. I mean, lots of people just despised Paul because so many Corinthians turned from their idols and their false gods and they received Christ. And so when Paul comes back to encourage them, somebody tells him, look, if you take the boat, it ain't gonna be no love boat, Paul. It ain't gonna be no cruise. And you start making your way, there is a plot on the boat, they're going to kill you and take your life. So he goes, okay, let's go to plan B. Let's go back. And that's why you have this dark line. He says, let's go back through, meet the folks in Troas, and then we'll come on down to Miletus, and then we will set sail into Jerusalem. Or we'll come, come here. So I want to ask you, church, if, watch this. Is it, wouldn't it be easier if he could just go from Corinth to Jerusalem? Why in the world does he have to go through all of this? You know why? Because God had a plan. Y'all ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like, Lord, just let me get on the open seas of the Mediterranean, hallelujah, and just be on my way? And God says, not so fast, my friend. I want you to go through here because there are some things I want to show you and reveal to you, and I want to especially do something with you in Miletus. Watch this, church. If he, he, if he goes from here to here, he's not going to experience all of these things that God wanted him to. Uh, to experience. So, so that's what is going on in verses three uh, through six. He decided to travel back through Macedonia. He's going to meet the ones in verse four in Troas. Uh, they're going to sail from there 
That, that, and they're going to sail from Troas back to Jerusalem. But they were on the circuitous route. And that's why I call this part of my message persevering. I mean, have you ever had a plan? You're like, Lord, I got a good plan. And, and I know you're with me, Lord, on this plan. Because look, I got all the, it's all lined up and here we go. And God says, no, kind of like Richard Stearns. I mean, he had a plan. Even after he accepted Christ, he goes, well, I'm going to be a CEO and then I'll just use my influence and my money and I will leverage for the kingdom of God. And God says, no, I got another plan. Aren't y'all glad that God has other plans? God's plans are bigger and better than the plans we have for ourselves. Now, we, we may not be able to see it right now, but we trust God and we walk by faith. Then it will be revealed to us. And I love verse four. These are his traveling companions, a heterogeneous group uh, for sure. I mean, these are men that Paul probably led to Christ and discipled them in all of those different cities. And now they are a part of his traveling band. Verse five, uh, the men in verse four are gonna travel on to Troas while Paul and Luke and probably Titus are gonna go back through, as I just showed you, in Macedonia. They're gonna meet them up in Troas and then they're gonna come together. Here's something really interesting, I thought. In verse six, he said, we gotta wait seven days until the feast of unleavened bread or Passover to occur, okay? He says, then we're gonna to go to Philippi, to Macedonia, and then we will meet you in Troas. Church, it took them five days to go just a small journey. And when you read in Acts 16, 11, it, the same trip from Philippi to Troas only took them two days. Now, there were probably prevailing winds. I don't know what all the issue was, but I'm watching Paul, and I'm like, there's a part of me who wants to say, God, help a brother out. Help that guy out. Lord, somebody trying to kill him. All he wants to do is take the money and go to Jerusalem. And Lord, you got him on this circuitous route. Lord, what is going on? Does anybody feel like that? Does anybody in the room feel like that? Lord, what is happening? I, I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to do the right thing. But God, you've got me on this circuitous route. And, and people are trying to take my life. And things are just not planned. They're not working out according to my plan. Look, when, whenever I start feeling like that, here's, here's a verse that God gives me. And it blesses my heart, encourages me. And I hope it encourages you. It's Proverbs 20, 24. Y'all ready for it? A man's steps are of the Lord. How can a man understand his own way? Is that not good? Man, I thought that was good. A man's steps are of the Lord. God directs our steps and our stops and our detours and our dead ends and our dry holes and our difficulties. God, sovereign God, is, is meticulously involved in all of that because he has something better. He has something. In Miletus, in chapter 20, when we get there <laughs> in a few weeks, we will get to Miletus and we will see where God's plan comes to fruition all along. So we got preaching, we got giving, we got persevering, and finally, we've got some just sheer serving and ministering, verses 7 through 12, and then we'll be done. You ready for it? 7 through 12, here we go. Now, on the first day of the week, that would be a Sunday. That's an important statement. People ask me a lot of times, Sabbath, Sabbatarians and seven-day Adventists, why do y'all worship on Sunday? And I say for two reasons. Jesus arose from the dead that day and Paul worshiped on Sunday. That's good enough for me, okay? That's, that's why we are gathered together, not on a Saturday, but on a Sunday. And that's my fun day. This is my worship day, right? This Sunday, thank you, Lord. When the disciples came together to break bread, now in verse seven, that's not just an agape love feast, which they did that. Look, when they got together for worship, y'all, it was so intimate. It was so powerful. Some of them were fearing for their very lives. They would eat a big meal, and then they would observe the Lord's Supper. Every scholar that I read in preparation for this message said the same thing. They had the love feast, where the agape feast, where they would eat together, and then they would have the Lord's Supper. Now, Paul is ready to depart the next day. He spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. Now, Luke is a first-rate historian and a medical doctor, and he's painting the picture for us. There are lamps. It's late. There's an atmosphere there. 
and I'm getting sleepy even as I'm talking about it. Are y'all with me? It's a darkened room. It's a three-story room, a home. They're worshiping up on the third level, probably for protection. And as one writer that I read said, the place is absolutely jam-packed, right? And Eutychus, bless his soul, the Greek word to describe Eutychus is paios, P-A-I-S, which means he's somewhere between seven and 14 years of age. And watch what happens to him. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was sinking. <laughs> he's sinking into a deep sleep. Somebody asked me the other day, Pastor, when you, you were telling the other day about people, did you see me taking a nap? I said, no, I really, I didn't. She goes, well, I was just really tired. I'm sorry I fell asleep. It's okay. It's okay, all right? God bless you. I'm, I'm glad that you're here. He sunk into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, <laughs> you know, like, just like you're doing, you're speaking, speaking, speaking. Hey, this is 30 minutes, y'all, 45 max. He's preaching for 12 solid hours. Some of y'all going, oh, heaven help me. I'd fall asleep too, Eutychus. He fell down from the third story. And he was taken up what? He was dead. You fall 30, 60, I don't know how many stories, I don't know how high it was, the three stories, but he fell out and there was a thud and he was dead. But Paul went down and fell on him just like Elisha did, just like Elijah did, prostrate, laid his body on this body of this child. And he embraced him and he said, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. And he, Paul, this persevering, giving, amazing preaching brother who is operating within the realm of the spiritual awakening. Man, wouldn't would that be awesome to see something like that? I mean, they are... I mean, this guy is dead, probably broken his neck. I mean, he's probably shattered his skull. I mean, I don't know what all's happened to him. Paul, I don't know if Paul's rushing to get on top of him so people can't see it because they can't see the deformity and the dislocation. I mean, look, y'all, three stories is a lot. Paul just goes over him and hovers over him, lays on him, and then God does what only God can do. Now, when he had come up, <laughs> Paul <laughs> broke bread and he ate and he talked a long time even until daybreak, and then he departed. And then they brought the young man. The young man is Eutychus. They brought him in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Isn't that cool? I mean, Paul, he's, he's there. He's, he's preaching the word. God is, is moving in power, and somebody falls asleep, and there's a big thud, and, and Paul just says, it's okay. God's got this, and, and then it hits us, and then it hits us. Had Paul gone from Corinth and blazed a trail through the Mediterranean Sea and made his way to Jerusalem, then the church at Troas would have never witnessed this amazing miracle of God. Could it be that God has you on a particular route or a particular arduous journey and you think it's just more than you can possibly bear, but God has a bigger plan in mind. That God has something that he's doing in you so that he can do through you that can prosper and bless everybody around you. And so we have a choice. Do we hang in there and we say, God, your will be done, not my will be done. God, do what you want to do. Close the doors. Let me go through the dry holes and the detours. God, do whatever you want to do because, Lord, I'm at your disposal. You're not at my disposal. I'm at your disposal. God, do what you want to do. And so that's the miracle. That's what we get to experience and to witness there uh, in, in Troas. Woo. Verse 10. Can I look at that with you just one time? It says, but... Paul. You know, a lot of times we, we get excited when we read in the Bible where it says, but God, and I love that. But in this instance, it says, but Paul. He, he didn't falter. He didn't freak out. He didn't say, well, there you go, God. I appreciate that. I'm trying. I don't even want to be here. I'm trying to get to Jerusalem, and here you have me in Troas, and here people falling out of the roof. God, died on me, Lord, while I'm trying to preach the word of God. What in the world? But he didn't do that. 
he saw an opportunity. He just jumped on the little boy and he, or the young man and he just laid on him. He said, but God is alive and God is going to breathe life into him. Now watch this. The same word in verse 10 is used, that thoroughbus word where it's translated uproar. It's used here in verse 10 like it was used in verse 1. In Ephesus, when the place was in an uproar and there was all this craziness and chaos and people trying to take Paul's life, Luke uses the same word. That's what was happening in the church. There was chaos. There was hysteria. There was this mentality of, oh no, Eutychus is dead. What are we going to do? And then Paul steps in and does uh, what only he can do by the power uh, of his spirit, of God's spirit. I don't know about y'all, but I, I read this story and I, I read Paul's life and I, and I see the, the nuances and the working behind the scenes and see God working. It's just so powerful. It's so rich. It, 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 fills, our, it fills our souls. Um, I, don't, I don't know where you are and what, maybe where God has you in your life right now on your journey. You may feel you resonate with Paul you, you, or you may resonate with Richard Stearns. You, you may feel like, Yes, Lord, I've got this plan, but, and I was reading my quiet time just the other day. It says, yes, a man, he plans his way, but God superimposes his will. God directs you where he wants you to be. Do you believe in the sovereignty of God enough to say, God, you got me where you want me, and I'm good with that? I believe you're exactly where God wants you to be, right here, right now, for such a time as this. And God's got a plan. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for your family. He's got a plan for your job. He's got a plan for your community. And here's the thing. God is just so much bigger and so he's so omniscient. He's so far above us. We, we can't see it for the clouds. We, we can't see it for the difficulties. We can't see it for the, for the plots and the plans that other people have for us. But God's like, look, I've got it. And watch what I'm going to do. So I don't know who this is for, Lord, but I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, that today... You've got a plan and you've got a purpose and you are orchestrating it and you're working it out, God, for your glory and for the good and the betterment and the benefit of Great Hills Baptist Church. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that you are working. And yes, Lord, we are. We're, we're praying, we're pleading, we're preaching for revival, for a, for a fresh touch from God, a move of God upon us. And Lord, until you do that, help us to be faithful, Lord, and keep serving you, keep preaching, keep giving, keep serving, keep persevering, keep ministering. And Lord, help us set our sails for the wind of the Holy Spirit to blow. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to blow upon us, to move upon us. Come rest on us. Mm, come rest on us, Lord. We open our minds, we open our hearts, we open our hands. And like the Apostle Paul, Jesus of old, we, we just want you to dispatch us, Lord, and place us and position us in ways that bring you the optimum glory, the glory of God. That is our prize. That is our joy. That is what we strive for, Lord, more than anything else. Thank you, Lord, that you're a God of order, that you're a God of a plan, that you're the God that works the possible. You are the God of the possible. So I, I, again, I'm praying for you. My head's bowed and my eyes are closed. And I'm not sure who you are or what your status is or where you are in your journey. Maybe you're watching, maybe you're one of those five, six, seven hundred people, literally people watching this message online going, that was for me. I, that, it's like you read my story. I, I'm exactly in this place and in this position where I am asking God for direction and for clarity and in, and instead of an open door, it's kind of like it slams shut or it's like I'm going on this detour or I'm, and I'm just confused and yet you're saying to me that God's in control. God has a plan. Look, I don't care if you're 98 or 8. If you're still a kicking and you haven't fallen out of the roof like Eutychus and you're still alive, God has got you. He got you. And he's carrying you. And he's using you. And he wants to do even greater things through you with your availability, with your yes. Would you join me, Great Hills? Would you join me in passionate, pleading prayer for a move of God? For, you say, well, 
A move of God is summer, Brother Danny. Half the church is gone. I mean, it's kind of quiet. And, and what, what, what a move of God. Wouldn't it be awesome? And maybe even over the next several weeks, you, you sensed a, a stirring, a fresh move of God upon our church where we see even more people baptized and where we see the, the deficit that is eliminated. And we see even more people called out to serve the Lord. I, I don't know about y'all church, I'm excited. I'm excited when this group comes back from camp. I wonder how many of them the Holy Spirit is calling. Some of these men, some of these women, some of these young men, young women that God is working in their lives. He's calling them to be missionaries and pastors and, and preachers. And some of y'all sitting in the room going, better them than me, brother, better them than me. Hey, 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 hey. Well, what, what if God's got another plan for you? What, what if God is speaking to you like he did the apostle Paul and said, Paul, I know you're going to Damascus with one thing on your mind and it, things about to change. Or Richard Stearns, I know you got your big Ivy League degree and you're going to think you're going to go on and make a lot of money, but I, I, I got another plan. What if, God, what if God's got another plan for you? W would you be open to it? Would you be open to the Spirit of God speaking to you and directing your ways for his path, for his, for his glory. Father, I'm praying in Jesus' name that as you call us out, Lord, there would be an obedience. There would be, Lord, a, a spirit of readiness and alacrity where we're willing and to say, yes, Lord, this is your church, God. I, I'm your servant and I'm your deacon over here. I'm your connect group teacher over here. Lord, I'm, I'm doing this for you and God, you put me. You put me, Lord, wherever you want me for the glory of God and the furtherance of his kingdom. Mm, that excites me, church. That excites me to know that, I know Becky Dean, she's been praying, and I've been, we're praying that God would raise people up out of our church who will commit to full-time vocational missionary service. And praise God for Ryan and, and Nora Flanagan. They did it. They left us, and they're in Honduras. Bless their souls. I mean, it's, it's quite a journey that they're on. I, I wonder if there's others of us that God says, I want you to go on this journey with me. And I want you to step out in faith. And I, I, I want to write a story in your life like I wrote for Paul's life. And it will impact so many subsequent generations until Jesus comes. So I'm praying, God. I'm praying, Lord, now, not only for those uh, students who are on camp, but for us in the room today, Lord, have your way, have your will in us. We're trusting you. We pray this in Jesus' name.